This is ABTV, Animal Bites Television. Hey, how's it going everybody? Jason Miller here. Welcome to 5 Weird Animal Facts. This isn't going to be a normal episode if you couldn't tell already. Uh, I'm going to be doing a quick tour of my animal room, show you what non-human organisms are living in my house at the moment. And uh, this has been requested a lot since the last one I made, so I thought for the 50th episode, what better way to spend it than by showing you guys the animals that, the weird animals that I live with every single day. Originally I was going to show you all of them in one super long episode, but instead what I'm going to do is uh, break it into two parts. I'm going to show you all my vertebrates first, everybody in my room that has a backbone, and then the inverts are going to be next week. That's because not only is it going to be a little bit shorter that way, it's also because I'm going to be going to a reptile expo on Sunday, which is three days from now, and I'm probably going to be getting some new bugs then, so I'm going to just wait. That way I'll have more cool stuff to show you, and it'll be a little more exciting. So first things first, you'll notice that behind me is the old vine snake enclosure, and I'll show you what's in there in just a second. But first, I want to show you what the vine snakes are in now. Ready for this? It's taller than me. This incredible enclosure was built by my dad. It was a Christmas present for me this year. And uh, as you can imagine, I'm pretty damn grateful for it. This is a beautiful enclosure. It's over six feet high. I think it's like six foot four inches high, uh, five feet wide and four feet deep. That is beautiful. I could not ask for a better enclosure for these amazing snakes. It's built for an arboreal animal and I'll show you them in just a second. I just wanna show you the design features of this bad boy first. So this enclosure is triangle in shape so it can fit into the corner of the room. It makes it more like uh, furniture or an art piece instead of an enclosure, which I'm a big fan of. Uh, it gives them lots of room, obviously, because that's very important to me is giving snakes as much room as possible. Uh, it's half land. The land half has a nice, beautiful plant growing in it that they can climb around on because they are arboreal snakes. And then uh, half water because these guys love their high humidity and there's some bamboo shoots, live bamboo shoots growing in the water as well. Uh, and we also have some fake plants, a fake vine going through just so they have some more stuff to climb on, some bamboo branches going every which way. It has a misting system that is on a timer, so it's like artificial rainfall, and that goes off about five times a day and soaks the enclosure really well, keeps that humidity up, and gives the plant something to drink. Uh, the entire thing is waterproof. That's rubber pond lining on the sides. That black is rubber pond lining. And it not only keeps water from leaving the enclosure and keeps that humidity up, but it also really makes everything that's in the tank pop a little bit more. So you see the snakes more easily, you see the plants more easily, and it just looks more aesthetically pleasing, I think, than just a plain background or a wood background. This right here is a cool part. If I undo these two latches, that's where I keep the lights. There is a uh, ceramic heat bulb in the back there to keep a lot of that heat in. There is a basking bulb in the back as well, and this is a UV strip, and, um, oops, sorry. And that's obviously gonna help the plant grow as well. Let's put that back up there, and it hides nicely. So you probably remember my vine snake, Groot. He doesn't like me very much. He's a little bit temperamental, and that's okay. I still love him, he's still beautiful. Uh, I actually got him a girlfriend recently. Her name is Gamora. Uh, same species, Ahitula prasina. She's absolutely gorgeous. She has this really nice turquoise color uh, that goes nicely with Groot's bright green. And she's super sweet. She's a really nice snake and I would take her out, but unfortunately she's in shed right now. And uh, I don't like to disturb snakes when they're in shed because I know it's very uncomfortable for them. And also she might give me a little bit more of an attitude if I took her out and she's feeling uncomfortable because that skin's getting ready to come off. So I'm gonna leave her alone. I'm gonna leave Groot alone because uh, he just doesn't like being handled. Period. And before you guys say anything, my objective here is not to breed these snakes. Um, first of all, because they're almost impossible to breed in captivity from what I've read. Not many people, if any people, have had luck breeding them in captivity. The second reason is that I don't have the time or resources to raise baby vine snakes and potentially try and sell them. Uh, that's something I don't, first of all, don't know how to do. Second of all, don't have the money to do or the time. I'm in college still. I'm not trying to breed snakes right now, especially not a snake that's almost never been bred in captivity. And uh, vine snakes definitely aren't for everyone. I love them personally because uh, I because I'm able to give them this much space and the right kind of accommodations and the right food. Because they're lizard eaters, that's that presents a challenge for some people. Uh, I get anoles at a really great discount from a local pet store, so on a weekly basis I can pick some up. And what I do after that is I raise them in this. 
And when you buy anoles from a pet store, they're usually not in the best health. Uh, and as feeders, I want them to be in the best health possible, so the things that I'm feeding them to are also in the best health possible. So what I do is I keep the anoles in here for a week, give them plenty of food, give them good conditions, and then when they are old enough and healthy enough, I feed them to my vine snakes. They'll eat about two a week. Um, so I have four in here right now. Next week, they're going to be lunch for uh, Groot and Gamora. Now, you're probably thinking this is a pretty elaborate enclosure just to keep feeder and oils in. And uh, the reason behind that is this was originally supposed to be for my rough green snakes. But there was a problem. There's so many little cracks and crevices where the rough green snakes could either get themselves caught or even escape the cage. I'm gonna wait a little bit longer until they're a little bigger and then move them into here uh, when they've reached a good size. So for the time being, my rough green snakes are living right there. Just a really simple 30 gallon enclosure. It's got some live pothos plants in there, a little water dish, a fake plant, um, ceramic heat bulb and a UVB bulb. UVB is actually important for this species. It's one of the few snakes where UVB is necessary for their uh, development. So here's the thing. I love my rough green snakes very, very much. They're so much fun to care for. They, uh, watching them chase the crickets around their enclosure is fantastic. They're easy to make space for because they only get about two feet. Um, unfortunately though, they are almost always wild caught. They're collected in massive numbers down in Florida and then shipped around the United States and sold at pet stores for around 10 bucks each. I didn't know this before purchasing one. That was my mistake. I should have done more research before making the purchase. And it's tough for me because on the one hand, love the animal and I love that I can give it a good life. On the other hand, I know it doesn't come close to the life it would have had in the wild. I'll go into more detail about my views regarding wild caught versus captive bred animals in a different video because uh, it's something I want to spend a lot of time talking about. But for now, all I'm going to say is I love my rough green snakes. Um, wish I got them captive bred, but since I already have them, I can't give them up. I love them too much, love caring for them, and I know that I can give them a really good life in captivity here. Um, better than they would have gotten if they were sold to someone else, probably. That's not me bragging, I'm just saying I have the resources, whereas most people who see a $10 little green snake would probably keep it in a critter keeper its entire life, uh, and that life would end up being very short. So on that happy note, let's move on to the next one. This is actually a new animal. Let me take you over there. Let me close this so... Oh, shit. There you go. Right there next to the guitar that I haven't played in months. So the animal I'm about to show you, uh, I'm going to get laughed at by my Australian viewers because it is very invasive in their country and very, very ecologically harmful in their country. But here in America, it's a real cool exotic pet, and it is a cane toad. Look at that. Real quick, look at their eyes. That, you have dirt. <laughs> look at how beautiful that eye is. Like a little golden galaxy. Isn't that incredible? These guys are beautiful. Um, still fairly small. He's got a bit of growing to do. I have no doubt that he's going to pee on me before this video is over. Cane toads, of course, are known for uh, not only being invasive in Australia, which I have the Australian flag rocking behind me, but they're also known for their toxin, which comes out of these little poison glands here and here. If I were to put pressure on those two poison glands, the uh, poison would kind of seep out, and that goo would give me a very bad stomach ache. Probably wouldn't kill me. Uh, definitely wouldn't kill me unless I had a severe allergic reaction somehow. But it still wouldn't feel good. He is going to get bigger. Uh, he's probably going to double in size by the time he gets full grown. And... I just love them so much, man. These guys are not picky eaters at all. I'll put a dead mouse in front of him and he'll eat it. I'll put a cricket, a cockroach, a superworm, whatever I have available. This guy's like a dumpster. He'll take anything. I've had him for about two months now. And um, he was also most likely wild caught like most cane toads are. The reason I don't feel as bad about it is because they're wild caught from places like Florida and Texas where they're actually an invasive species. Um, and if it's an invasive species that you're taking out of its unnatural habitat, it's kind of doing a good service to the ecosystem. Um, uh, and I think that's actually a pretty good thing. But they're so beautiful, man. Let me, let me show you those eyes one more time. 
Come on, focus. There we go. Beautiful. Uh, he's about maybe half the size he's going to get when he's full grown. He'll be about double this, maybe even triple this. I've seen some pretty massive ones. <laughs> There's that defense mechanism I love so much. All right. How much you got in left? Any more? Any more pee? That's all over my carpet. That's like your entire body. These guys are like water balloons. They'll store all of that, and then in case I get picked up by something, first line of defense. Look at he's like, he's shrunk since then. Because that was all pee inside you, huh? All right, now you're getting antsy. I'll put you back. Here, refuel. I'll put you in your water dish. All right. I get to sit down for this one. Isn't that nice? Next, I'm going to talk about my beautiful Firebelly Toads. You might remember them from the last room tour I did. The difference is, they're a bit bigger now. And uh, they actually have a new roommate. They have another Firebelly Toad in there with them. <sighs> Isn't that exciting? I've said it before and I'll say it again. Firebelly Toads are fantastic pets and I highly recommend them. They're, <laughs> they're so cute. They're adorable. Uh, you're hearing those little noises is because they think that I got food. And they're actually, they're actually jumping up because they think that I got food. These guys show no fear towards me. Um, I think that has a lot to do with the fact that I raised them from tadpoles. If I stick my hand in there, if they come to my hand because they think that I'm going to give them food, they'll actually jump onto my hand, bite my fingers a little bit. Uh, they're total pigs. So I wouldn't say that they have a bond with me, but uh, I would say that they enjoy eating. And that's about it, so let's move on. Next up, I got my buddy Cujo, the African Bullfrog, or Pixie Frog. You probably remember him from my last video as well. He has grown a little bit since then. Here he is. And I won't let him jump out of my hand this time. As you can see, he's got his adult colors now. He's completely solid green, and uh, he's getting really yellow under his chin and under his belly. That makes me think he's definitely a male. Pixie frogs are great because uh, they don't need a whole lot of room. They're not like the firebelly toads where they're constantly moving around, constantly jumping around. He pretty much sits still and waits for food to come to him. That's how they spend their days. As with all amphibians, this is one that you only take out when you really need to. Uh, not only do they not really enjoy playtime, they also can absorb the toxins on your hands through their skin. So that can cause some health problems. But other than that, they're really cool. Don't, they, they're not super demanding as far as care is concerned. Keep that uh, temperature around 80 degrees, give them a lot of humidity, give them some places to burrow, and they're very happy. All right, guys, the last one I'm gonna show you this week is my gold dust day gecko named Angel. She is right here hanging out on the plexiglass. Uh, this is not, <laughs> there she goes. Uh, this is another handmade cage my dad built for me. He's a very nice man. So let me tell you a little bit about how I designed this enclosure. We have a couple of live plants, some cork bark, and um, also leaf litter on the bottom, and a fogger up at the top. All of those things combined create a very humid environment, which these guys thrive in. And also the live plants and the leaf litter at the bottom, they give it a very earthy smell. Whenever I open this enclosure, I feel like I'm breathing in a tropical jungle because it all smells very alive, uh, for lack of a better word. And that's another reason why I keep so much life in my animal enclosures. The vine snake live plants, the uh, rough green snake has live plants. I think every, yeah, every reptile or amphibian that I have has live plants in their enclosure. It's so beneficial. It oxygenates the air, it holds humidity really well, and it just looks better. You know, you can watch it grow, the environment changes, that creates a little more enrichment for the animals themselves. And it's something I recommend to any animal that can have a live plant in their habitat as long as you make sure it's not toxic and uh, it kind of fits with the environment that they're currently in. Thank you guys so much for watching this quick update on my little animal family. Again, this week I just showed you my reptiles and amphibians. Next week is going to be a lot of fun. I'm going to show you all my invertebrates, my arachnids, my insects, and I have a lot more of them than I do anything else. Some would say too many. I say nah. -uh. So until then, follow me on all my social media crap and subscribe to ABTV for more awesome animal things and stuff. Until next time, my friends, my name is Jason Miller and I'll see you next Monday on 5 Weird Animal Facts. My name is Brian Barczyk. I've been working with exotic animals for over 25 years. I'm no zoologist, just a guy with a passion for animals. And that passion often takes me on animal adventures around the world. This is ABTV.